Good evening, I'm Emily Steele. Tonight I want to read some excerpts of uh, a book that I've written. And yes, it's a book of poetry. Um, I started off in this, uh, my first programs uh, four or five years ago was, um, was a book that I had written called uh, uh, Lust, Love, and Innocence. And um, I haven't really written, read too much of my work uh, over the past many years, but uh, I'd like to take advantage of doing that now since I've got my book near publication uh, ready. And um, the name of the book is called The Cantos of a Believer. And um, it starts with, of course, the opening poem is uh, Cantos of a Believer. I stood on an open balcony overlooking a wintry lake as the icy evening summoned the advance of darkness. I had forgotten the goodness of friends and shelter of safe homes. I had forgotten the ability to cope without the liquid or smoke. I was my dream, the enigma, the hurricane, the tornado, the crack of lightning in the void of the after hours. I was a spirit flying to heights beyond his comprehension, as Icarus with wings of gossamer, sewn with threads of faith and hope. The night calmed as the wind subsided. Over the lake arose a ghostly form as fog over the blackness. In the hours past midnight, I stared into the dark near the deep, dangerous edge until I saw the sun rays of reason. My next poem is the called uh, At the End of All I Know. At the end of all I know is the unknown, and there I am. Eclipsing the sun, but aware of the day, I create my own shadow. Seldom is a man so bold to engage in the creation of his own myth and legend. But if I don't, who will? Um, next poem is called The Song of Self. From the dark shadows of loss, love emerges and the sacred self awakes. In the holocaust of hatred, we die or fall. In love, we live or rise. On the lost soul's journey, its horizon widens, focus evolves, and spirit strengthens. To the Song of Solomon, I write this addendum. In loving self, all is love. From communion with woman, I recreate myself and new memories of love. From the love of a woman and her memory, I relive my passion, and from it find resolve. I am without sin, guilt, or fear in the chalice of a loving memory. Yeah, i change subjects now. Going into uh, kind of seasonal poems. My next poem is called The Spring. Robins return from winter nests as spring winds blow warm over sun bright seas of meadow flowers reaching upwards into blue. Jealous winter warns of spring as the violent time of changing when rivers overflow their banks and mudslides ruin winter landscapes. Winter screams its great March winds that threaten cold and April snows, then fade as haunting echoes and morning frost melting in the rain. 
What resonates true is the voice of spring from thawing brooks and greening mountains. Birds sing and flowers dance in brilliant colors with fragrant breezes. Calendars are turned a page to reveal the blossoms of May. Aries and Taurus begin their fight until overthrown by Gemini. Goaded by the ram and teased by the twins, the bull and poet resist their yokes of winter and fall and are moved only by passion and recent change. They wait with faith the return of their season, the lush hues of green and the warm light of May, when the poet writes of love and communion and the bull mates as the world is reborn in spring. Now, going from spring, we're going to jump right over to winter. Next poem is titled Virtual Storm. Yesterday the snow fell 15 inches in the northwest part of the state. Blackbirds, crows darting back and forth outside the kitchen windows seemed confused of each other's size and shape and flustered by the incessant rain of white. They appeared as black spots flying through a static-filled television screen, though they were far away from the world of warmth and vision. They were as holograms or ghostly virtual reality. It had the same effect on me. Perhaps it was fear that inspired this poem, the fear of my one day not knowing. Unable to discern the real from the unreal, not knowing the difference because of cynicism or indifference. The fear of not knowing how I feel or why as a subject in a micro study group to decide if a blackbird and crows can really fly or if snow can really fall 15 inches overnight. Okay, make of that a, what you will. Um, I had the pleasure of having this, uh, uh, the good fortune of having this uh, next poem uh, published by The Voice newspaper. Um, and uh, they did a beautiful job uh, publishing it. They did a kind of a double page, and I thank the guys for doing that. Um, as you know, the voice no longer is publishing. However, um, I want to thank them for this one. It's called White Fields. There are no sanctions in life. Each thought or action is balanced. Each day brings night, each wrong brings right. To the right of darkness is light. Rolling in level fields of white stretched before the wanderers of life. Every knoll has a veil and every depth has a height. There may be fences or covered rocks, mole holes or trees here and there. The fields lie flat as white mats or carpets of dazzling colors. Images and holograms of attentive light darting in and out of sight. A spirit may wing by as a swift blast of wind or tread lightly nearby, embodied in the coat of a deer. A message of memory in a frozen fallen leaf whirls at play near your feet. A dancing thought on the white field of nearly forgotten time. A time known to a single mind. White fields of winter crusted over by ice, wind and snow. Melted by harsh rays of sun or broken by footsteps leading on. On to the forest or into the horizon. On to a destination known only to one. White fields of melancholy places as blank expressions on white faces 
a blank stare at the world where color dots the landscape, creating beauty to evoke complex passions. There are white fields that remain untrodden, outlined by the green borders of golf courses and cultured forests, where live snowmen, snow women, and snow children, and an occasional white stallion running on white ground within the boundaries of white corral fences in white sounding towns. Towns of milk and money, snow white people with Christian virtues suffering snowy spiritual hallucinations and discomforts of frozen noses and cracked lips chapped by the blistering boredom of dreary days of blinding white. They read sun-blinded blurbs on newsprint, snowy computer and television screens, causing infectious white diseases of eye strain and migraines, cured by aspirin, alcohol, Prozac, or cocaine. White fields sometimes turn to yellow and sometimes melt away from fevered heat. But in the Arctic and Antarctic circles, and rural plains of snow and ice, white fields remain forever white. Though global warming may melt away layers of ancient ice caps and expose a colored history, white fields will remain white until the rains of change bring great floods to destroy all in anarchy. Then the muddy colors of mighty rivers overflowing their banks will forever change the once white landscape. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed that one. I enjoyed writing that one. Um, I'm going to take a little twist and go into something a little deeper. In the East Rising, this is the name of the next poem. In the East Rising, the sunfish spawn in the trillion miles of starry universe, and the sacred settings of the solstices await the diamonds and glowing light around their centers. The seven muses are molested by derelict poets who take shelter in the ruins of Olympian temples and sell their sacred inspiration. Sold to the warriors of spoils of crimson battles won to sing glorious praise of barbaric deeds beneath the hot light of the earthly sun. Their silhouetted anger poised against shadows of forgiveness locked in battle by crude embraces and offensive movements of their bodies and souls. In the impeded silence of morning, the cirrus cloud sweepers press the brush of air into their black canvas and paint over it a blue sky, a green earth, and yellow sun. Artists sit in the cool shade of the cypress bakes, basking as reptiles. In the quiet air, their sleep and dreams are defined by the direction of the breeze. Calling are sirens of dangerous songs. Erotic dragons smoking smoke curling into the lungs as corporations imprison the young with vice and obsessions, debt and greed. Under the lesser sun, in the rays of lust, the earth searches in primal instinct, groping for the innocent. The eastern winds blow harsh, hot air, hard and foreign as Satan's wings raise, summoning dead spirits to prowl. The innocent lusts of virgins sing to the satyr's sacred flute. Then they are kissed with whiskey breasts, breath and fondled by calloused hands. They dance in the confines of his gaze, laugh, cry, live, cherishing their gifts, their happiness, until the lamplight dims and their dreams unfold. The saber teeth of magical monsters enter their dreams of fear until they scream and shudder and push them away. 
ecclesiastical chants and mystic incense clear the room of evil spirits until the sacred one appears and guides their dreams toward the safe harbor of dawn. <clears throat> this next poem was inspired by a documentary I saw several years ago. It's called The Borderlands. And uh, it's kind of where I was, I guess. It's called The Borderlands. I live in the borderlands. Here is where despair meets the edge of the future. I live in a shanty without heat or light. I am without death or life. It is here that I am, and I do not know how I came, but it is here that I am. If I could hold the world responsible, I would. I would blame all if I could. I spoke to you tonight, and you were all right, and that meant all to me. I am writing to you from here near the edge of the future, in the borderlands. Um, my, uh, my next uh, poem deals with uh, some research I've done over the years and, um, and some interesting uh, things that have happened over the years. But uh, this is called The Shaman's Dream. In the dreaded world of elongated dreams, reptilian smiles rest. Down in ruins lie the dead chanter's spirits, guarding their ancient graves. Rainforests shelter shamans beneath banyan trees of dreams. Within the shaman's skulls, eyes stare downward into hell. Cat and carnivore familiars come to lead the wanderer's journey down, where the angered one deceives wandering souls by their own self-deceit. A grand cavern, a sacred, secret tomb. A mass grave of innocence, silent in their belief. Demons curse and guard these souls for fear of their revenge. The veil of death has been lifted for these and revealed the great mystery. From the center of darkness, the shaman's soul rises into his thousandth reincarnation. The music of a distant drum begins, creating the rhythm of his heartbeat. Next poem. It's called The Talisman. In the light of an unknown power, forces are dulled or primed by time and the circumstances and substance of a man's dream. A charm can ward off evil and Lilith's secret desires, that whimsical nature of lust grounded by the force of light. Break the spell with the talisman's power this amulet of rare alloy carved by orbital entry in sorcerer's hand. A mystical meaning in a handheld charm protecting the innocent from malice unknown. The celibacy of hate sterilizes the air before the foul and evil power of rage can enter the ether. The talisman performs with its invisible rays that project out from a circle of sacred power within the soul. Signs of Solomon's, saint's bones, crucifix, rabbit's foot, eagle feather, magic dust, incantations and symbols of divination, all conjure expectations.
my uh, my next poem is um, kind of a segue poem into my next poem. And uh, this particular one is called, What About the Moon? As the falling ashes of midnight glimmer the gold reflections of the sun, the sequined sorrows of tomorrow will rise as dissipating fog that blankets the earth beneath the moon. The centerless abyss blackens the doorway from light as the leaning silhouette enters, madness curls around the room. Madness disguised as musical rhymes, refrains as inane as your life, joyful as birth, dreadful as death. The last spoken prayer summons the winds to kidnap the sound and carry to oblivion the last known part of you. Um, my next, uh, the next poem was during a period of time. Uh, I used to do a lot of, a lot of, a lot of walking. <laughs> uh, I used to enjoy walking through the cities, especially at night. It's a lot of interesting things to inspire poets. And uh, I may leave you with this poem, but uh, there's one more that I'd like to read before I end. This poem is called Down Baldwin. In a vision deluded by tears, I await clear view again for a celestial visitor with a voice of wisdom. From the confines of an earthly prison in the cell of the mind, the voice recants its call and I am lost again. In the grand light of a dream, I walk under the stars and streetlights with all with old friends and cynics, virtue and vice. In the succession of time, I hesitate to walk and step as I feel the age of body listening to its warning. In the silence of the street, the heart beats rapidly in the rhythm of fear and atonal thoughts. Regrets of past decisions flash, flash rather, as thunderclouds of shame, bringing storm and rain to collide with peace again. A simpleton sings, playing with notions of contentment as a dark shadow lurks in the doorway. He grasps the ball and jacks after hurling them into the air, then holds them tightly as I pass, taunting me with his grip on reality. I enter where future light is dim, a street light glows, a hazy ha ha halo. As I walk down the street, strewn with losses and debris. Brown eyes begging as I walk past a door, long brown legs and fishnet stockings whispering their price. As Jesus smiles with his gold tooth and dangling cross, selling Maria and dime bags of paradise. Women lean out their windows as they look to the street, remembering or calling out the lovers. As children play in the stairways where homeless sleep, white men cruise the streets for a trick and a bag of weed. All night diners close suddenly from, broken win from window broken and police sirens. Ambulance arriving ruined any chance of a cup of coffee and a late night snack. I move into the darkness as the remains of the night scratch at the door to be let out before dawn erases its nagging existence. They, uh, this poem is my most recent and uh, it'll be the last one tonight. And uh, like all my, I'm sure my viewers know that uh, controversy is part of the L.A. Steel tradition here. So this, uh, this poem is called Blood Red. <coughs> 
These are turbulent times of masterminds, plotting and waking dreams of revolution in a world at war, screams of adult victims and cluster bomb children. Arabian nights lit up by fire as oil fields burn and pacifists ponder imperialist powers negotiating oil rights disguised as liberators to plunder historic Eden. Freedom and liberty chased into flight, exiled with nomadic refugees, disguised as desperate women fleeing to Pakistan, Iran, and Jordan, where they will plot resistance and revenge. Blood-red streets of Baghdad, blood-red stains upon the souls of Muslims, blood-red stains upon the hands of an American president savoring blood-red wine with his meals in Washington. Blood-lusting demons of insatiable greed, brothers of the blood-red fraternity, join him at state feasts of blood-red meats and blood-red gravies, where they plot for power, money, chaos, corruption, world domination, genocide, deceit, war, and global destruction. Washington, D.C., where demons drink power and feast disguised as leaders of corporations, arm dealers, heads of state, lobbyists, and madmen, all members of the Christian right, blessed by their reverend. The Christian right blights the marbled halls of the capital as blood-lusting cultists revel at the murder of the sons of Saddam, lunatic hypocrites sing the national anthem praising the American Revolution as they smile in contempt at the angry voices of millions of patriotic Americans. Congressional power, mad cultists elected by Republicans and Democrats mirrored their corporate constituents, representing America's darkest ambitions. Cowardice, contempt, greed, vice, corruption, racism, bloodlust, cruel, ignorance, incompetence, and indifference. They allow the blood-red radio and television of the conservative media to control the nations with lies and propaganda, censorship and commercialism. Public, ra ra public relations firms are glutted by media pundits and politicians desperately seeking their service of public deception. Revolution, 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 revolution. How loud must true patriots cry? Revolution, 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 or the dream of America will die. And uh, that ends tonight's program. I thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'll see you next week.